This is Matilda by Roald Dahl. Chapter 1. The Reader of Books It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you can imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration, they manage to convince themselves that their child has the qualities of a genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all of this. It's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us a basin, we're going to be sick. School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents but they usually get, back, get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for children of doting parents. Your son Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, it is a curious truth that grasshoppers have hearing organs in the sides of the abdomen. Your daughter Vanessa, judging by what she's learnt this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say, the periodical cicada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son Wilfred has spent six years as a grub in this school and we are still waiting him for him to emerge from his chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might enjoy writing end of term reports for the stinkers in my class, but enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children, and these are, of course, far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda, and the parents looked at Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something that you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next county, or even further than that. It is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children like scabs or bunions, but it becomes a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary, and by that, mean, by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble, and she was so quick to learn that her ability to, should have been obvious, to even the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was a perfectly normal boy, but the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that short, small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother. And when she read this from cover to cover and learned all of the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said, do you think you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the television, for heaven's sake? We've got a lovely telly with 12-inch screen, and you come asking for a book. You're getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work, and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. 
Mrs. Wormwood was hooked on bingo and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, taken slightly aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl, unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on the lower shelves, Mrs. Phelps told her. Would you like me to find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took only ten minutes and allowed her two glorious hours sitting quietly by herself in a cozy corner, devouring one book after another. When she had read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering around in search of something else. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over. Can I help you, Matilda? I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I finished all the ch children's books. Matilda looked down at Matilda from her great height, and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden the best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind the closed wall, and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Four years and three months, Matilda said. Mrs. Phelps was now more stunned than ever, but she had not the sense to show it. What sort of book would you like to read next, she asked. Matilda said, I would like to read a really good one that grown-ups read. A famous one, but I don't know any names. Mrs. Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous, grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance, the kind that is written for 15-year-old schoolgirls, but for some reason she found herself in instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Mrs. Phelps told herself. But to Matilda, she said, of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with a book on her lap. It was necessary for her to rest it on the lap because it was too heavy for her to hold up, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. And a strange sight it was, this tiny, dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Miss Havisham and her cobwebbed house, and by the story of the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words. The only movement from the reader was the lifting of the hand every now and then to turn over a page, and Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, It's ten to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps said to her, Does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to Aylesbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda said. She doesn't know that I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs. Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Just mooch around and watch the television? I see. They don't really care what I do, Matilda said sadly. Mrs. Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village High Street and the crossing of the road but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Mrs. Phelps. Has Mr. Dickens writ written any others? A great number of them. Shall I choose you another? Over the next six months, under Mrs. Phelps' watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following. 
Nicholas Nickleby, Oliver Twist, Jane Eyre, Pride and Prejudice, Tess of the Dovervilles, Gone to Earth, Kim, The Invisible Man, The Old Man and the Sea, The Sound and the Fury, The Grapes of Wrath, The Good Companions, Brighton Rock, and Animal Farm. It was a formidable list, and by now Mrs. Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement, and it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond, but not Mrs. Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mr. Hemingway said a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda had said to her, especially about men and women, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel like I'm right there on the spot watching it happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that, Mrs. Phelps said, and don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you, like music. I will, I will. Did you know, Mrs. Phelps said, that the public library like this allows you to take and borrow books and bring them home with you? I did not know that, Matilda said. Could I do that? Of course, Mrs. Phelps said. When you have chosen a book you want, bring it to me so I can make a note of it, and it's yours for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom became her reading room, and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate that she made, warming the milk in a saucepan on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally she made bovro or ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading in the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. She went on olden day sailing trips with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling. She traveled all over the world while sitting in her little room in an English village.